Namaste. Yesterday we were talking about the yugas. It's a very fascinating subject and not understood in modern India because in some way people got onto the idea during Kali Yuga that this Kali Yuga would last for another 432,000 years. Now it's 430,000 years just about. But the, um, if you look at history, this is the best proof of it. Because you see, first of all, that it, what Sri Yukteswar said is true. There's a nadir, a low point in 500 AD. From then on, everything begins to come up. You know, there was a... The, uh, my guru um, said that William the Conqueror was an incarnation of his. It's a very strange thing for me. I was raised in the English system, and uh, I had always thought of William the Conqueror as one of history's great villains. And here I found he was my own guru. But I did a deep study of that. And then I asked a friend of mine who was a scholarly temperament to do research. He researched it for 10 years and has written a book on the subject that is coming out just about now. And, uh, you know, William the Conqueror, he, his body was exhumed after 450 years and his, it was incorrupt. He was obviously... He obviously had something going for him. He was, in fact, a great master, but he was an avatar. And in the Bhagavad Gita, as you will see in a later chapter here, that it says, whenever virtue declines and vice increases, I incarnate on earth as an avatar, a descent of the spirit onto, uh, into matter, to punish vice and to place virtue on its proper seat again. Now, he doesn't punish the evildoers, but he punishes evil. And so you see the difference really between an avatar and an ordinary saint is that the avatar has a certain avenging um, uh, duty to perform. He has to change things drastically. And William the Conqueror came to bring about great changes in a country which, if because it was separate from Europe, if he could bring a real change into that one country, then it would affect the whole of Western civilization. And historians say that everything we are today, we owe to William the Conqueror. That's an astounding statement. But in reading that, that uh, book, I have that story, I have been just amazed to see how his real friends were only saints and monks and so on. He created many monasteries. He set England on the path of Dharma. And England is the oldest country in the world. The, you know what the second oldest country in the world is as a country? America, United States of America. We think of it as it is an, a new country, and it is new. But so many countries have been always changing, changing, changing. India certainly has changed a lot. But English constitution based by based on what William the Conqueror and his son Henry I accomplished. That has endured all these years. Now England's karma is finished, my guru said that. But for such a long time it endured. I have always felt that I was Henry, his son, who carried on his mission. And so this book is actually has a very interesting title, Two Souls, Four Bodies. And uh, Anyway, some person read the life of William the Conqueror and said, well, people couldn't have been that dark. People are people. But I answered, no, in the yugas, people in those days did have a darker consciousness. He had to act in ways that he could not act today. Wouldn't be necessary. People's whole consciousness has changed. What happens is that when the rays of the... We're, we're part of a cosmic environment. And when those rays come to the Earth, because of the Earth's movement through our galaxy, when we pass through that section, well, then man becomes more enlightened and increasingly so. So in this rising Kali Yuga, we find people becoming more and more enlightened. Back around 1500, or the close of the 15th century, in 14, the poem goes, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, this is so. There suddenly became an awareness of the whole world. 
and the Italian Renaissance and awareness of Greek and other cultures and so on. This gradually came up into the beginning of the 17th century, 16 and so on. Uh, Galileo, um, Tycho Brahe, all those old astronomers and scientists, the birth of physics itself as a science began just about then. And with the dawn of 1700, we find that there is a beginning, a real spurt toward a more enlightened kind of society. It's less dependent on uh, just people born as noblemen and so on. You find much more a uh, tendency to, uh, it's the industrial revolution, to give equality to everybody. You find the French Revolution, which was a horror in itself, but it was in, based on this desire for equality. And uh, as we came up from that into the, 19th, into the 19th century, the 1800s were in the second Shandhya, the 200-year Shandhya. First, for Kali Yuga, there's a 100-year Shandhya, and that is the 17th century. For Dwapara, there's a 200-year. For Treta Yuga, 300-year. For Satya Yuga or Krita Yuga, 400-year Shandhya. So this Shandhya, during the 18th, 17th, and I mean the 18th and 19th centuries, this Shandhya was a period of gradual upliftment. But uh, come 1900, we suddenly find a great spurt forward. You know, um, Duell, I think his name was, he was the head of the um, patent office in America. And some people say this never happened, some people say it did. Whether it did or didn't, it symbolizes a very definite truth. The story is that he, pe he petitioned President McKinley to close the patent office because everything that could possibly be invented had been invented already. Well, it's since then that we have everything we connect with modern civilization. Electronics, radio, television, travel to, other, to the moon, uh, rockets and uh, spacecraft going to Mars and so on and so on. We're only at the beginning. We're in a hundred years, a hundred and, well, um, this is uh, uh, 2010, so 110 years into Dwapara Yuga. This means that uh, we have another, Dwapara Yuga itself lasts 1,200 years, 2,400 years. Kali Yuga, 1,200 descending, 1,200 ascending. Then Dwapara Yuga, 24, Treta Yuga, 36, Satya Yuga, 4800. And in this period, we will find people going to other galaxies, even other planets. Space travel will be a normal thing. And many things will happen that now are even inconceivable to people. But many of these things will begin happening more and more in your lifetime. I don't say mine because I'm pretty well ready to check out at the age of 84. But uh, this will go on. And those of you who are young will live to see a very different world. What we are facing today is the lingering habits of, Dwapa, of Kali Yuga. And I would say that communism was, you might say, the epitome of Kali Yuga. And from now on, we'll be having an understanding that you don't, you don't improve society with systems. You have to improve it with consciousness. One of the most important things that we will see happening in this new society, I believe that our six billion people on this planet today, there won't be that many left after this great trial that we're coming to in the future. But from then on, there will be uh, smaller towns. This, these big cities, Gandhi and others have said, and I agree with them, that big cities are a disease it's very difficult in the uh, increasingly tamasic atmosphere of a big city to think in terms of, ex of high ideals and noble principles and so on. Um, businessmen are full of greed and personal ambition. This is why we're right now falling into a great depression, much worse than the 1930s. People will not even have enough money to, fight, to live that have food to live. They will, many people will die of starvation. But the solution to that is one that I have always believed in since the age of 15. And when I found that my guru had the same, the same solution, 
then I really put my heart into forming communities. I have formed eight now in, on three continents. But the ideal is that if you can have a few people growing their own food, building their own buildings, living simply, you don't have to have posh clothes and so on, you will find that you can live very simply. And if you can have a few people whose ideals are high, if everybody at Ananda, we now have about a thousand people living in our different communities. If every one of those people were to go to a different city and get a job in the, in the city and live in the suburb as most people do, at least in America, um, you would find that uh, their influence would be very little. People would notice that here's this one person in our office who's very peaceful and uh, manages to, man to create peace around him. And they'll ask him, well, how come you're that way? And he says, well, I meditate and practice yoga and so on. And of course, their answer will be no. It's probably just because you're a very special kind of person. I know somebody came to Ananda village many years ago and said, you have some wonderful people here. I answered, if you meet one or two, you can say they're wonderful. When you meet everybody who's like that, you have to say it's what they are doing that makes them wonderful. So communities like this are the answer for the future. In small towns, where you small countries, small towns, these are manageable. There will be uh, a oneness of all nations in a sense, but they will also be small enclaves within that. People can really relate easily only to a few people. It's very difficult to relate to a mass of people. So these communities are an ideal for the future. And I urge you, because soon you may not find it easy to do, get land, gather a few friends who are of a compatible ideas, get land in the country, grow your own food. There are many ways of learning how to grow food very profitably. Um, the, there's mo something we're practicing in Ananda village in California, which is uh, um, using the soil to replenish the soil. And with different layers of that soil, you can produce many, many crops in just a small area. This is well worth learning. Do take my word seriously, because otherwise you'll, you're in for a lot of suffering now. We're not in an easy time. Will there be this cataclysm that Yogananda talked about? I think that when, the, when a planet starts getting too confused, too bad karma, the universe itself responds. I would not be at all surprised to find some huge interplanetary cataclysm happening. I sound like a gloom and doomer maybe, but I, I believe what I'm saying. So anyway, in Dwapara Yuga, people become aware that this universe and of matter is really composed of energy. So Dwapara is an age of energy. And then Teta Yuga is an age of thoughts. It's an age when people communicate more by telepathy. Even now many people do, but it's sort of in its primitive stage. Will people have that power in the future? Yes. The interesting thing about India is it has survived. It has survived many of these yugas. And whereas old civilizations have all died, one country has managed to survive. And what has been its secret? It has loved God. This is the secret of India's success. Please don't leave that one great good karma. India will rise again. I know that I met Abdul Kalam a few years ago, and he said, do you like what's happening to India today? I said, it's necessary. I know that it's become much more materialistic than it was when I came to India in 1958. I met many saints then. I have not met saints now. I found much more desire for God than there is now. But in those days too, I said, India has to claim its position among the great nations of the world. And it has to learn how to relate to other nations. It has to develop um, materially also. But I said, India will not be able to lose its spirituality because the great rishis of ancient times have impregnated the soil with it. There is something in India that even those who claim to be atheists, they will not be able to leave God. 
There is a certain holiness in this country. As my guru wrote in his poem, My India, I am hallowed, this body touched, that sod. And those were the last words with which he left his body. As the, his, his words sod, he turned to one side and slipped to the floor and left his body. What a dramatic exit. But uh, this Dwapara Yuga then will become Treta Yuga. And in Treta Yuga, they can, time. the thing is in Dwapara Yuga, you demolish the delusion of space. In Treta Yuga, you demolish the delusion of time. And advanced people during Treta Yuga will be able to see what will happen uh, in the future. This is why Brigu Sanghita was written in the uh, downward Treta Yuga. And he could tell things about, he could tell that I would have, he'd mention my name, he could tell that I was a, a uh, um, American born in Romania, had brothers but no living sister was possible, and many other things. And they've all come true, which is really quite amazing. Some of them didn't seem possible, but they've come true. So in Treta Yuga, that ability is there. And in Satya Yuga, you don't find many old buildings from those years, 1,200, 12,000 years ago. But that's because people didn't need buildings. The climate of the world was better, and people had the power to just create peace wherever they were. So in Satya Yuga, you will find a very peaceful and harmonious era. Will you live then? No, you'll probably not. You'll probably go where your own particular karma at this time will take you. But in time, you too will reach that stage. Joy to you.